Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco, and today we're going to be speaking with Ian Lewis. Ian is a, an instructor in Jeet Kune Do and Kali under Danny Nosanto. He's a full instructor of uh, progressive martial arts, uh, progressive fighting systems under Paul Vunak, a truly terrifying person. And he's uh, an instructor under Fred Mastro in MDS, Mastro Defense System, another terrifying person. Uh, but Ian is a wonderful guy and, and he embodies uh, the spirit of martial arts to me. He's uh, he's. He's the guy who can be extremely dangerous if he needs to be, but but that skill and the ability to keep it keep it in its sheath is what makes him, uh, you know, a, a truly excellent person. Uh, plus, he's just fun to talk to. Uh, Ian is also a close friend of mine, and uh, we trained. Uh, I trained with him in Jeet Kune Do for a while. I haven't trained in a little while, but now, uh, you know, when I first met him, he was a, a babe in the woods, and very, very quickly became very, very good became my teacher, and now I'm going to be uh, going back to his school sometime soon. So it will be my pleasure to bring Ian on in just a moment. But first, I want to say, if you are uh, a fan of this show, if you think what we do here is valuable, uh, that is the weekly interview show, the midweek supplemental, Thursday Night Knives Live, and now we have the deep cut coming out, uh, uh, which will be more of a special where we go 30 minutes with someone and go really deep on a topic like like uh, the first one, Jimmy Slash and I talk about XL cold steel knives and go down the rabbit hole. Uh, if you think all of that is worthwhile and, and you have a little extra scratch, please go to Patreon and join at any one of the levels. You can join three, five or ten dollar level when you're at the ten dollar level. Uh, you're entered into a monthly knife contest. So uh, uh, knife drawing uh, giveaway contest. So. Uh, well, please consider it if you're interested. Uh, so now I bring you Ian Lewis. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Hey, Ian, how are you doing, sir? Ian, how's it going, sir? It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Happy to be back. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I haven't spoken to you in a little while, but we've, we've been, uh, we've been speaking recently, and it's so good to hear from you. A lot of, a lot has happened uh, for you, for everyone, for the world since you were on episode eight. And I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to catch up with you. So, for people who didn't listen to episode eight, didn't hear you, uh, tell me a little bit about your background, how you got involved in martial arts, and, and where you are today. So the martial arts started for me uh, when I was young. I was about nine years old. I did, um, I did I'm 27 now for the viewers listening. I, uh, I started in Taekwondo and I trained that for about two to three years and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't really what I was looking, looking for. I knew I liked martial arts, but it wasn't really the type of martial arts I was looking for. And then after an attack, when I was in Europe with me and my brothers, we were attacked by a, a, a group of people. It was a necessity for survival and self-protection which was what, me, what pushed me to move into the martial arts and self-protection and self-defense and all of those, those aspects. And, um, and then out of that necessity for survival came the passion for teaching and just the passion of training in martial arts. And it really became a lifestyle after that. And it led me to uh, amazing people. So. Wait, okay, I want to back up. Uh, you've told me this story a bunch of times, but I'm one of those guys who, when I, I like a good story, I keep asking to hear it. Tell me about the uh, this mass attack scenario, because uh, uh, for those of you who who, who don't uh, aren't familiar with martial arts training or, or the, that mindset that you get into when you're in heavy training, you do think about mass attack because you're frequently just training against one person, but there's always the specter of mass attack looming over that. So tell me about that situation. Yeah, so I, uh, I was 18 years old, uh, brand new. I think this was in August, I believe, of, of 2012. So, yeah, I was 18 years old. And um, I just turned 18, and I was, you know, like a young, cocky kid. And I, I basically uh, had, was a little bit of a hothead, to be honest. And, I, I stuck, and a guy uh, heard our accents that we were American. I was in, we were in England. 
And um, he commented sarcastically on our accents. And of course, I re-engaged him, thinking I would be on, in on one-on-one fight. You know, I had zero fear against this guy. And, uh, and then it turned out to be a group of people, you know. And it was shocking to me to see all those bodies get up and realize that everyone at the clo- uh, everyone sitting there at the closed cafe on the beach, they all knew each other. And there were about 20, 20 to 25 people. It, went, it, it was a large group. And, and when they all stood up to back each other up, it was a, it was a very interesting feeling. You know? That must have been a, a, a stomach churning or a, a, a heart dropping. Uh, I, yep, it just falls into your stomach. Yeah. So how did, how did you get out of that situation? You're here with us. How'd you do that? Running, dodging, footwork, uh, which was very difficult too because I was with my, my two brothers who I love very much. And, uh, it, you know, when you're, you're trying to take care of someone else while thinking about yourself, that's when the danger happens. That's when I got punched in the head. Um, and that's when my brother was tackled to the ground. And it was just a shit show from there. Because when you're, when you're moving at that speed under the adrenaline and you're looking out for someone else, uh, it's, it's very dangerous, right? So, and that's, that's exactly why in the military, for example, they, they are trained to such a high level where they're trained to take care of themselves so they can take care of each other. Right. But me being exposed to this for the first time and hopefully never again, knock on wood, but that is what was really dangerous because you're looking, I was looking out for my brothers, seeing where they were at. It was dark. It was chaotic. It was super fast. They were all over the place. You know, your head's spinning, you're running around, your heart's beating out of your chest. So there's just, there's a lot going on there. As opposed to me being attacked by myself, my instinct would be run. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, we're, the martial arts I, I listed off that you are uh, expert in um, have huge blade components to them. Um, but before we get there, what was it? What was the main attribute um, in your, well, you, you did, you weren't trained at this time, uh, but when you were escaping this mass attack, you mentioned footwork. Uh, I, I want you to stress how important footwork is and then take it into the bladed arts and why it's so important in bladed work. Definitely. So the, the, the footwork in a mass attack is, um, the most important thing and also the spatial relationship. And what I mean by that is the distance between you and the, the opponents. And when there's multiple opponents, and they're chasing after you. Uh, And this is a principle I actually learned from my teacher, Paul Vunak, after this incident. And um, I actually made this mistake in this mass attack that I was a part of. And uh, I'm very lucky that I'm here to talk to you right now because of it, because it was luck. And that's cutting down the middle. So what you basically do in a, uh, when we train mass attack scenarios is we uh, make what's called an eclipse so we're basically fighting one person at a time and our footwork is so where only one person is able to approach us and that is used with lateral dodging and footwork so that's the primary attribute used and when you add the weapon into that it's very important for the distance distancing depending on if you're using a machete length weapon or a sword or even a box cutter the distance is different so knowing that distance is very important. So the attributes come out at a higher level when you use the blade. Uh, I know I know a number of um, famous uh, Kali teachers uh, in which you know you, footwork is uh, a huge part of it. That a lot of times that's what you learn first. Um, have gone on to not gone on to, but uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, extracurricular careers in in showing um, NFL players and and NBA players. Uh, some of this Filipino footwork or some of this just, you know, being nimble on the feet, evasive footwork. Definitely. Um, so uh, how, you know, when I first started martial arts, it was in karate and Kempo karate. And that was, that was a great, I, I really like Kempo karate. It's, a, it's similar to, it's like a proto JKD to me. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a lot of openness to it. Um, but we did very little with knives. It was always some sort of crazy uh, uh, empty-handed knife disarm technique that was trained and rehearsed. And um, how, how is training in Filipino Kali, the Filipino arts or MDS, which is based on Silat from Indonesia, how, how, how are those bladed arts more realistic? 
So again, for me, it, it always goes back to attributes and reflex training. Uh, if you're doing a static technique in a dojo, and let's say I'm an angle five, or for the people who don't know Kali, like a prison shank, you know, where the blade is just coming to the belly. If you rehearse those movements so many times, it's, uh, it's one way of training. It's not wrong. It's just one way of training. What you get in the Filipino martial arts is the, the ability to flow and adapt to different angles coming in at different times where your body is doing the talking, so to speak. Your body is moving viscerally without thinking, right? And that's very, very important. So uh, the ability to bring out that attribute of reacting to the blade without thinking about what you're going to do is something that is a, a big part of Filipino martial arts. And that comes out through the drilling and the knife sparring and the weapon sparring and the single stick, stick drills and double stick and espada y daga, which is stick and dagger and so on and so forth. They all have a place, but that's what you're really learning. You're learning reflexes and attribute development and the line familiarization. So that's the benefit. You know, uh, like you, I'm sure. Well, I know for a fact. I love watching martial arts videos on YouTube. I also love checking the comments and seeing what people are thinking. Same thing on on Instagram. I like to see what people. And you frequently see, you know, when you see someone doing Kali and, and doing a lot of uh, either doing Carenza or or doing some flow drills uh, with with partners and stuff. You hear a lot of like, well, that's real pretty, but like that's not how it actually happens. Um, you know, it's a, it's more of a prison shanking, like you said, a knife encounter. So what's the value of, of doing all the fancy stuff? So the, the best example I could do, I could uh, use for that is a boxer who uses a speed bag, right? A boxer who uses a speed bag. Have you ever seen the speed bag technique in the ring or in the street fight using boxing where you're doing that technique? Because it's not designed to be applicable to the actual situations designed to bring your attributes up that will help the ap actual application. And that's very, very, very important. So for people who say it's not gonna happen that way, all that means to me is they don't understand the art. So they need to get educated on it. So it's a, um, it's a, a way, to perfect, way to perfect the things that go into what you would actually be doing, your speed, timing, distance, and all that stuff. So how MDS, Mastro Defense System. Um, so this is the third of the art, uh, third of these uh, of these arts that you've been training in. It's the one you're you're so heavily immersed in right now. How is that uh, differentiated from the rest of the martial arts you do, other than the movie Taken? That's that's that was my introduction to Mastro Defense System. So how is it different? That's your question. Yeah. So. The reason that I, I fell in love with MDS after training with uh, Sifu Paul Vunak, Guru Dan Asano, and many, many other teachers, uh, Grand Tuhan Leo Gahe of, of the Pekiti Tertia system, is primarily because it's adapted for self-protection and street self-defense based on my teacher Fred's master's background, which is VIP protection, security. Uh, he's bodyguarding people like 50 Cent. He's the personal bodyguard of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, he's also <laughs> a fight choreographer. Right. So he took his actual experience from 20 something odd years of personal protection and street experience and, you know, use the Bruce Lee concept that uh, absorbed what's useful and then rejected what's useless to a, to survive a street encounter, a self-defense encounter where you're protecting your life. Right. And that's that was my main goal going into the martial arts. And that has now become my passion to teach other people. So uh, I, I remember, um, well, seeing Taken and, and uh, Liam Neeson, who plays an executive uh, um, talent guy. And, and wait, by the way, I'll get back to Taken in a second. But you, you said he's the bodyguard to Jean-Claude Van Damme, and I snickered. And uh, let me explain. I thought it was hilarious that Jean-Claude Van Damme has a bodyguard because he's, you know, a certified badass himself. So I, I figured... It's kind of funny. Hire another martial artist. But uh, in any case, the movie Taken, I remember thinking that uh, all of these fight scenes like the I remember trying to figure out what it was. And I was like, it's kind of Kali like, you know, or, or Panantukan or whatever, uh, empty hand Filipino. But it was a little bit different and a, and a lot more abrupt and uh, um, had a directness to it. Um, what, what's the what's the back philosophy to it? So the, the philosophy behind the MDS is to stop the attack 
as soon as possible. Where And, and uh, although other arts, to a degree, they might not use those words exactly to promote their art, but the idea behind the MDS is is uh, we don't want to find out what you're good at, right? If I, when you're, when you're having a street altercation with someone and someone is attacking you and it's cold outside and you're not fresh out of the gym and someone attacks you with a knife or empty hand, you don't know their skill set. You don't want to find out their skill set, right? So the idea is to finish the fight as soon as possible. So we adapt our techniques based on what is the most efficient way of bringing the fight to the close. And, and, by doing that, we need to research all the martial arts, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Thai boxing, Filipino martial arts, Sila, and then adapt to what is most likely to happen in a street assault. And then we practice from there and we really test that stuff. So it has a real extreme sound. I mean, you're saying, we, you know, I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but basically we neutralize the threat immediately and completely. And to me, that sounds like, wow, that's that's like... Um, and, and believe me, uh, I admire it greatly. I am in no way criticizing, but it sounds so final. Uh, what, what kind of techniques do you do? How do you ensure that you're not just going to, you know, snap a neck, snap a neck or, you know, do something too much? So the, the, the way I like to describe that is a principle I learned from my teacher, Paul Bunek, and that's what he calls injuring a person to degree. So what does that mean? That basically means what is the appropriate amount of force that I need to use in this situation? And what's important by that is, and that takes a long time to acquire, and I can get into that as well. But what that basically means is in different scenarios, different uh, approaches are needed, different strategies and tactics are needed and techniques. So if I am, uh, I've been training for about 10 years religiously, almost, uh, you know, nine and a half years, so coming up on 10 years, I will handle a drunk man potentially differently than a woman who has just learned self-defense. My tactics will be different. My strategy will be different based on my level of training and experience versus someone who's brand new to self-defense or martial arts in general. So the, the techniques are adapted based on, on the situation and what needs to be done. And the reason why MDS comes off as, as, as extreme is because protecting your life is extreme. Uh, it, it, it could be called self-defense if you get into, if you're uh, 21, 20 years old and you're at a, a bar fight in college, you know, I've, I've had a situation like that. Was it self-defense? Yes. Um, but it wasn't to the, to the degree of someone, uh, if when I'm walking down the street with my girlfriend and someone attacks me with a knife or is a real intent mm -hmm. to bash my head in. Right. So the, the mentality behind that is different. So you need to adapt for the, the right technique and right strategy, right tactic for the right situation that you have at hand. And that comes with experience, but also training. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Uh, the thing I was thinking of as you were talking is experience, you know, um, the longer you're in anything and yes, you use the word religious. I would say, I would say most people are less religious than you are about martial arts, about their own religion, because you're an everyday, all day kind of, kind of guy with this stuff. Um, but, uh, it's like with that experience, you you gain the knowledge through handling so many different bodies just in classes and, and in your own training. But also you've, you know, uh, like most martial arts, think obsessively or artists, think obsessively about it, talk to other people obsessively, research, you know, constantly. And so you're developing a philosophy all all the way, you know, the, the whole time you're doing it. Like, uh, so what is your philosophy on um you know, using weapons is very serious. How, how do you, what's your philosophy on escalation of force? So my philosophy will obviously vary from other people. And the way I, uh, the way I look at it is basically what do I need to do in terms of the, how severe the situation is. And the number one thing that everyone can do, and this comes through not being cocky and not having a big ego and maybe getting in a situation where you were lucky to make it out safely, right? And then saying, I need to avoid confrontation because everyone, no matter how talented they are, um, the more dangerous you become in martial arts, the more you respect it and the more you respect what you can do to people and what others can do to you. And it's not a, it doesn't, it's not a game anymore. So you learn to avoid. And then when it's time to fight, you fight like, you know, 
like yeah. a demon because that's you know that's what you need to do because it's going to be done to you so that's that's very very important uh so i want to talk to you about a, about the characters and in my mind and just knowing you there are four major characters i know there are others but uh that went into your training um actually there are more than this but i want to talk to you about uh who's danny nosanto who is uh paul vunak who is fred master like as as people who are these people uh cuz they they all have kind of crazy stories and uh um you know and also uh leo gahe uh, tuhan leo gahe is also an interesting cat so uh, tell me a little bit about these teachers and what you got from each one of them Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so I'll start with I'll start with Guru Dan. Uh, Guru Dan was uh, obviously is the protege of Bruce Lee, and he runs the Inasano Academy of Martial Arts out of Marina del Rey, California, which I trained at for several years. And he was a huge inspiration for me, just in terms of the amount of martial art knowledge. He's the most knowledgeable martial artist on the planet, walking around right now. There is no one whose brain is filled with more knowledge than him right so yeah. that was amazing to me that he he's a huge inspiration to me because he was one of the people who who inspired me to reach out and train in all these systems right and to never stop learning and always having the student mentality and that's a very interesting concept too because everyone all of my teachers have that mentality so now moving forward in my life as i keep my old teachers and adapt to new teachers. That is the number one characteristic I look for is that I am a student. No matter how talented I am or how talented other people say I am, I am a student. Because with that mindset, you will go far. Without that mindset, you aren't going anywhere fast. So, and then on to Paul Vunak, who is my biggest inspiration in, in martial arts. Um, I had a, uh, I was researching after I was attacked in Europe the, the best street fighting, street fighting teachers in the United States, and I stumble across the name, Paul Vunak. And um, I asked my uh, current teacher in, in Falls Church where I was training, have you heard of Paul Vunak? And he just happened to say, yes, I'm actually an instructor under him. And I said, I'd love to go out and train with him. What do you think? And he said, absolutely, let's do it, you know? And so I went out there in 2015 to get my apprentice instructorship, and that's actually how I met Guru Dan. But the, he inspired me because of his philosophy and his upbringing and all the uh, real fight experience he has. And that's what his system is about. It's the root of Jeet Kune Do. It's not the movie Jeet Kune Do. It's, to, it's the way of the intercepting fist for the real street fight, for the combat. He's taught SEAL Team 6, other Navy SEAL units, and the Rapid Assault Tactics Program, which is an infamous program in the martial art world, you know. Um, so, and that was just the start of finding teachers like Fred Mastro and my teacher, Sebastian Vandenberg, who is the uh, head instructor for the Mastro Defense System in the United States. So, um, you know. It's... Paul Vunak, man, he's got a, uh, he's got a real uh, aura to him. Um, like I, I was at one seminar uh, in New York in 1999. He came to Anderson's Martial Arts and, and uh, he taught the rapid assault tactics. I remember he started the class. He said, you know, uh, why, you know, we're all assembled there sitting down and he's kind of talking to us and he says, why do you all want to learn martial arts? And people raise their hands to protect myself. Cause I live in New York, this and that. And he's like, no, 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 no. The answer is maximum security prison. That's why you want to learn martial arts. So you don't die in maximum security prison in case you find yourself there. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be a fun two days. <laughs> what are we going to learn here? And it was all about the head butts, knees, elbows. And then, the. uh, uh the biting and and the other stuff uh, got you got a little bit of that pinching and and then going flowing between sticks and knives and wrestling and boxing and in one bout, uh, he just seems like one of those dudes who kind of sits on the mountaintop and people kind of claw up the mountaintop to to get some of his wisdom. But he's he's kind of a nutty guy. I, he's he's a. Uh... He's, he's wonderful as himself, you know, and he's, uh, he's, he's incredible at what he does. He, um, uh, and the knowledge that he can give you in a short amount of time is, um, you know, I, I, I told him in person one time, I was taking a private lesson with him and I said to him, I said, Sifu, if I could give you a million dollars, if I had a million dollars to give you for the knowledge that you've given me, 
I would give it to you. And because that's how much I value the information from all of my teachers. I, I really, really do. Because it's things that, that you acquire that you just don't forget. And then if you work on them and practice them and grow, the results are just incredible. And they're just, they're gems that you can't, that there are, there's a reason why people like Paul Vunak are known for why they're known because they have something to offer that just other people do not. And those are the, those are the teachers that I've been fortunate enough to come across and not only come across as at a seminar, but actually become, you know, close with them and have a good relationship representing them and, and, uh, you know, them being like my big brother at the same time, you know, and I can say that about my teacher, Fred Mastro and Sebastian Vandenberg, it's a very family oriented group. And that's, uh, that's one of the things I love most about the Mastro defense system. Uh, I want to talk about about Fred Mastro for a second, but before we do, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Tuan Leo Gahe of the Pakiti Tertia system, and uh, and like all of these guys that have this knowledge that they're passing along, and it's all actually hard earned, like Vunak and all the street fights and the videotapes and the analyzing, like he's a football player. I've heard those stories, and uh, uh, Leo Gahe was a was a bodyguard for Imelda Marcos, I believe for for quite some time. And he has some, some very particular opinions about some very deadly techniques that I have a feeling, uh, comes from experience. What can we, I mean, is, do you think that you can really glean from someone else's experience? I've always been someone who learns the hard way and, and, uh, but being in the presence of these people, you get the, you get the feeling like, this is not something I want to learn the hard way. I'm going to take, take their word for it. So how do you decipher whether, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of fake martial arts out, out there. How do you decipher for someone who's new, maybe showing up to a school? How can they know if they're in a good place or not? So uh, I think a, a good bullshitter can spot another good bullshitter, right? And I think uh, a lot of it is um, from what I've seen attending uh, many of Fred's seminars and actually being his his demo partner for, uh, you know, the dummy, so to speak, where he would mm -hmm. try a lot of the, to demo a lot of the techniques is that people who have never done martial arts, look at it and go, I could see that actually working as opposed to training with someone and saying, ah, I, I, there's a lot of movements there. There's a lot of, uh, complex motor skills. You know, people always talk about gross motor movements under stress and things of that nature. So a lot of it's logic. And I also look at it in terms of taking, um, and learning from their experience, it's important to look at yourself and what your attributes are and how you compare to that individual. So if, uh, if you take an athlete, like let's say an athletic man, for, for example, and he has an athletic teacher, he may be able to uh, have similar qualities in terms of being a martial artist and a fighter that he has, but you're always going to be different. There's different body types, there's different attributes, there's all of these things. Um, but the wonderful thing about MDS is a lot of it is adaptable to people across the board in terms of their attributes. Um, so that's one of the things that I really like about it. So what is the main approach uh, to this system? So I would say the approach is to have a conditioned body. There's a lot of uh, uh, conditioning drills, you know, to condition the arms and the legs, which again is conditioning the mind, which is very important, which is a new concept for me when I started. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an amazing feeling training in, in martial arts and, and think you're doing really well. And I was doing well, you know, I, I was doing well, but then thinking that it, it would work in what I was hoping it would work for, which is a street altercation to protect myself, because that is my goal. I train mixed martial arts. I'm a three, uh, third degree purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I train Muay Thai. I train boxing and I do all of that fun stuff, but I'm not an MMA fighter. It's not my, it's not my passion. And my goal was again, from the beginning to protect myself and survive a violent encounter, survive, not play by the rules, not do anything like this. So that going to the MDS and learning how they really prepare for that from my teachers who have many, many experiences in street altercations opened my eyes. And I knew what I had to do at that moment to continue my growth. Interesting. So, so a choice arose. It's like, am I doing this 
for self-perfection or am I doing this for self-preservation? Not that if you choose one path, you can't dabble in the other, but in a way it's like you were at a crossroads. Absolutely. But, uh, however, the prior martial art training I had in the Jeet Kune Do and the Kali and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Krav Maga and all of the things that I, I was training all at the same time skyrocketed my progression in MDS because of the base that it mm. gave me. Right. So, uh, martial arts is never wasted. You know, someone who, who trains 25 years of karate and does an MDS seminar and realizes that that knife technique, you know, uh, to the throat did, doesn't work, their, their time wasn't wasted because there's an attribute, there's a quality. It taught them something that is going to help them utilize the new skill that they're learning. So it's never wasted, but that's what I really see people uh, that's what happens to people when they, they, uh, you know, train and yes, and yes, there's a lot of shit talkers There's shit talkers about everything. And all I'd say to that is come try, you know, yeah. <laughs> my doors are open. My teacher's doors are open. You know, all the, uh, there's only a couple instructors in the U S. Um, but, uh, there's, you know, we're, we're here. If you want to tr try, if you have questions, you know, just, uh, I'm not worried about the internet warriors anymore. I can't do it. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, it doesn't. It they just don't matter. Uh, I, I want to talk about knives with you, but before we do, you just opened up a school. Uh, tell me about the school and where it is. Yeah, so the school is in um, Alexandria, Virginia. It's right off Little Little River Turnpike, so right off the highway. Um, I don't have a gym name yet. I am working on it. It's a very recent gym opening. Um, it's designed for small group seminars and uh, certification courses and private lessons. Um, and people can check out my Instagram page for upcoming classes and seminars and all that kind of stuff. That's cool. That's a good way to do it, especially around here, you know, in the, uh, capital region, the nation's capital region, there are a lot of, a lot of spooks and spies who need to know this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. I, it's a great, it's, it's a great location, you know, it is. And I'm excited to offer, um, you know, the, the unique training that I, that I, uh, teach because I, it, people really enjoy it. You know, they, they really do. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's talk knives. Um, I, I want to talk about, uh, we're going to talk, I want to ask you what your opinion of the Pical style of fighting that's been kind of trendy recently, the Pical style of sort of fruit knife uh, is, but before we do, I want you to show me your EDC. I, I love what you carry. Right on. So <laughs> oh, here we go. This is the Bastinelli chopper. It comes in this uh, in this beautiful box. It's like a part of it's metal and part of it's plastic. It, it says the chopper on the side. I don't know if you can see the logo on the front. That's uh, Bastien's logo for Bastinelli knives. And I'll open it up for you. So this is a new uh, smaller fixed blade knife that I recently acquired. It was a gift to me, and um, I actually had a call with Bastien himself yesterday on carry options for this. It's a, it's a wicked knife. It's about two and a half ounces. It has a three and a half inch blade and a leather carry concept on the front. It's basically just a buckle. And I carry this currently in reverse grip and I just take the knife like this. And it's almost like I was talking to Bastien yesterday. It's a, it's a Persian type of design. You know, it almost has like a fillet blade style. Um, yeah. And it's my, my, new favorite edc because of the grip it's extremely lightweight i can change it and hold it in different positions i can go edge in edge out i can go forward grip i can hold the knife with the edge facing the inside um and it's super lightweight very easily concealable and um but for me his his blades are just the best and sometimes i'll have a small backup blade as well like this is the best manelli pika karambit it's just uh it's a very traditional karambit you know a lot of the um in the olden days in the Indonesia and Malaysia, the, the karambits were actually smaller and, uh, and the, uh, the designs got bigger over time. This is more of a, of a traditional karambit style and it's, um, it's very easy to use and you know, play around with. So sometimes I'll add a backup blade, uh, but that's usually, I usually have one, one knife on me. So, and I usually go with fixed blade if I can. So what's the most, uh, important part of the knife to you i know we've had this conversation so i'm baiting you but what's the most important part of the, the knife yeah yeah so for the blade itself i i uh 
obviously it has to be sharp, but I love the grip. And that's the concept I learned from Fred Mastro is the grip is just as important, if not more important than the actual knife. Because even if you have a wicked blade design and it's razor sharp and it can stab and slash or cut your meat, whatever you're, uh, you're using your knife for, if the grip fails, the knife will fail. It doesn't matter how good the design is or how sharp the knife is or if it's designed to stab or slash. So grip integrity on the knife, whether your hands are wet or God forbid bloody when you're using the knife, you need that grip integrity. So that's uh, that's a big concept. And for me, uh, I'll show you another blade I have here. It's my one of my, again, I, I can't pick my favorite from Best <laughs> and Alien Knives. I'm, I'm obsessed, you know, like my collection's growing. I have a couple here I'll show you, but this is the Protect Yourself, the PY from Bastinelli knives designed by my teacher Fred Mastro, um, and it has a five in, five inch blade, a really well designed handle, and again, forward and reverse grip is extremely important in in really Filipino martial arts in general, and also the MBS and the grip on the, with the thumb on the back for cutting power, and then the reinforcement with the thumb on top for for stabbing. But again, this is a bigger knife, so I this this was my EDC since 2017 when I got this knife. I actually got it from uh, Bastian himself at an MDS seminar in Los Angeles with Fred. So uh, it's a very, very special knife to me. It's the it's number 53 out of 100. So it was within the first 100 made. Um, and I carry this religiously for three years. And now I just kind of, you know, now that I'm a collector of Bastinelli knives, like uh, oh, I buddy. I um mix it up but they're just they're wicked knives and he's an incredible guy you know uh so yeah. i would definitely i highly recommend him and i would i could you know uh oh i i, I was agreeing I with you he's an awesome dude yeah oh yeah and i i guarantee if anyone buys his his blades uh you know you just won't regret it you know you like you hold it and you're just like this the craftsmanship is is beautiful i've never seen anything like it in a knife so yeah, beautiful craftsmanship. He, he has them made in Italy by Fox. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it's Fox Knives, and I have one by him, uh, the the large Drago Tack, or the big Drago Tack. This is made by Lion Steel, you can see in there. Um, so French design, Italian manufacture, uh, all the money comes, most of the money comes back to America because he's in Florida. Uh, yeah, he's a cool dude. I, I really, really love his knives. But in general, you know, there are a lot of people out there. Most people out there don't have your skill set, don't have your knowledge or, uh, you know, uh, don't necessarily care to acquire it, but might be curious uh, about knives as self-defense items. Uh, maybe they're not interested in mace. Maybe they don't want to carry a club around, whatever it is. They don't have a gun. What do you tell people? Because uh, ultimately, I mean, uh, inevitably, you'll get the question, what's the best knife for self-defense? And you have to have an answer for that. Um, that isn't, oh, you got to get a karambit. I'm sure you have a more complex answer. What is that answer? You know, it's, it's interesting you say that because um, I was actually wa watching one of Bastian's videos, the founder of Bastinelli Nods, yesterday on his Instagram page. And the, the idea of a knife being the perfect knife for self-defense is, is a bullshit concept. And the reason is it depends on your body type, where you live, what the laws are, what your job description is, what you're able to carry. For example, if you were, if you're a hairdresser and you want to carry a neck knife, that might be doable under your, under your t-shirt or your button down, whatever it is. But if you live in Texas and you're a police officer, you might like a Bowie knife on your hip, right? So, so to answer that question, you have to look at your personal needs. Now, in terms of a design, it's not the most important thing I could do. Someone trained or untrained with a knife this size, like the Pika Karambit, could do very, very similar damage to something like the PY if it's used properly, right? So it's, um, you know, it's like it's the person using the weapon. It's not the weapon itself. So that's a very important thing uh, because these knives are razor sharp, you know, and this is like an inch and a half blade. This is a five inch blade. They both cut you to the bone. They can both uh, disable you. They can both take your life. So it's dependent on your needs for carry. Okay, uh, I guess maybe a, a different different part of that question is, what do you tell a person who has no training but wants to carry a knife for self defense?
I would say train and I would say uh, what is their, their lifestyle and what are they comfortable carrying? Like what, what can you see yourself carrying on a daily basis? Like me carrying the, the PY, I carried this for years. And I was like, you know what? I love it, but it's just a little big. Now I'm carrying the chopper and I forget that it's on me because it's like two and a half ounces, which is incredible. It's eight inches overall, three and a half inch blade. And it's very comfortable. It's not a nuisance for me to carry, but that might be a little big for some people. So I'd ask them what weight and size are you comfortable carrying? And then I'd ask them about the design. Do you intend to stab? Do you intend to slash? Are you opening boxes? Do you want a little bit of everything, right? Because there's yeah. designs that are more efficient for overall tasks. And then there are designs that are more designed for specific tasks, right? So those are the first questions I would ask. So Ian, what, what do you think of, uh, as a knife fighting expert, knife training and all of that, what do you think of these knives? These, uh, this is the Ed Calderon Copus Designs Elvia. Um, you know, it's one of these Pical style knives with the tip down and the edge in. I think it's, I, I think they're great. Um, I think again, for me, the, and this is a concept I learned uh, primarily from Fred Mastro, uh, who goes into a little more of the, the detail on how to use the knife overall than say Paul Vunek, who talks more about attributes and defanging the snake. Fred gets more into certain grips and uh, philosophies of the knife in different positions. So a call grip for me is for close quarter engagements if you're talking about a self-defense perspective. So it could be creating space to get to your primary weapon if you were in a law enforcement or military position, or it could be in a self-defense situation, drawing the knife in a close quarter situation, getting a stab in, getting a slash, and then disengaging the fight. Because your job isn't to attack and finish the fight like a military person, it's to cut or stab with the knife and escape. So it's a, it's a, it's a retention technique. So I think they're fascinating. I love them. I love the edge in concept. I don't have too much experience with that, but I love the idea of the reverse grip for the close quarter work. You can use it like you're boxing. You can use it to trap and hook depending on the arcs that you train. And it's just a fun concept for me. So I, I love it. Hey, I, I was talking to Ed Calderon on this podcast and, and I asked him about that and about the sort of odd angle of the blade coming off the handle and, 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 Asked him to contrast it with uh, karambits. I don't know if you've seen this karambit, by the way. Uh, oh, I have, yeah. Yeah, okay. So he's like, well, they're, they're two fundamentally different things. And people frequently frequently will say that the karambit is something that appears in nature, you know, kind of like a claw. But he says, no, claws are never like this. You never see a cat scooping up uh, its prey like this. You see it reaching out like this and tearing this way absolutely and um and and i asked him about that angle because to me it looks a little broken right it looks like uh, and when you see it on the folding version oh i don't have it close at hand but when you see it on the folding version it it looks like a uh, a knife with a broken back pin or a stop pin i asked him about that and he said that it has to do with um you know we were talking gross motor movements He's in, in his experience, like that's all you got in that kind of experience, in that kind of situation when it sneaks up on you, especially if you're not training 24 seven in that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, your wrist, your elbow and your shoulder all naturally arc. So this uh, angle kind of reaches and, and, and goes in right at the right angle, uh, given all of those arcs. And I thought that was an interesting answer. Uh, I, I like the idea, but uh, you know, uh, with the kind of stuff you and I have done and the kind of stuff you've taught me, there's a lot of hooking and trapping uh, with the knife this way in, in say, Kali. Uh, but that angle makes it look like it would slip off. I've had this, I've gone down this rabbit hole with people and I don't, I don't mean to uh, belabor the point, but I just think they're, uh, they're kind of a really interesting recent-ish development. Yeah, I think... Uh... So I think Ed's a, a really interesting guy. I would love to meet him one day. I have a ton of respect for him. He totally knows what he's talking about. And that's a, that's a true statement, that reverse grip, right? Even even with, uh, you know, like the chopper that I'm carrying with that, the thumb on the back, when I'm able to stab down, I have a lot of power with that, with that grip. And it's, a, it's very realistic to say that's what you, would, you will use a lot of the time 
it, especially if you deploy the blade that way in a self-defense encounter or a military encounter, whatever the uh, job description is that you're using the blade. Um, and so that's a really, really good point, you know, and that's why I think the design, like if you look at the, the Pika Karambit here, if I have it like this, it's not so much of a claw, but the second I change it to forward grip, mm -hmm. this is, you know, and, and this is, you don't have like when I'm in this grip, there's some things people can do to change, but it's not like in this grip where you can flail the knife around and have fun with it. Right. So, but this grip, the cutting power is tremendous. And even with this inch and a half blade, when the blade goes in and you can use this hand to reinforce and cut down, it's a very interesting concept and it totally mimics the claw. It's going to dig in and it's just going to tear, tear down. So he's absolutely right about that statement. Um, and I, I love the knife. I, uh, I'm not again, too familiar with the edge in concept, but I really, I really like it. And I agree with him on the philosophy. If you're in a high stress situation and you have a knife in a reverse grip, you're not going to be necessarily doing all the collie slashes and movements. It's going to be a gross motor stab, you know, until it's it, until it's done, you know? So. so, so how, how is any of this relevant in the age of the gun? So it's a question I, I ask every knife expert that comes on this show, knife combatives expert, uh, because inevitably there's there's got to be someone out there who's like, yeah, yeah, all of that, but I have a gun. And that's, yeah, uh-huh. And I, I like discussing this topic. I know I'm very, I'm not educated well on firearms. I actually currently have a teacher. He's a student of mine. He's a student of mine. He's a former Marine. Um, Iraq war veteran. He's a, a certified NRA pistol instructor who I'm training under so I can learn the gun and learn how to use it. But the, the people who say, I'll just shoot you. The problem with that statement is, is I believe you. If you, if you uh, take one thing into consideration, you practice creating space and using empty hand skills to take out your firearm. If you're carrying a gun, appendix carry, waist carry, whatever, concealed carry what it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're in a close quarter engagement and someone's knife is already drawn they can close the distance on you extremely fast before you can take your gun out so the knife can be an amazing tool in that way um, unfortunately it can be used for harm and for good you know depending on the application but that is something people need to be aware of and it's why they need to be educated on the knife especially if they're gun carriers because what I, I see a lot and hear a lot, and I've experienced this myself, is the uh, I have a weapon, I can use it, and then people never even practice drawing the weapon under pressure, right? So that's a that's a skill in itself. You know, I'd say most of your repetitions, instead of working on your stabbing and your slashing, is just getting that out in a fight scenario. Um, I've assisted yeah. some of my teachers in training police, and I've done a lot of... Uh, military type training and I've, I've sparred with a lot of people when we're allowed to draw our knives there's a unique class that i was used to be a part of for uh eight years and we were allowed to use our knife during the fight we could take it out at any time we want and kill the person and so to speak and then reset and if i took them to the ground or was using my jujitsu i was easily able to trap the weapon arm and do my combatives, my striking, my elbows, all that kind of stuff, because they didn't practice creating space to get to the weapon. So it's a it's false confidence for the people saying, I'll just shoot you, because the reality is, is you'll get stabbed before that will happen, unless you have dedicated many, many hours to realistic fight, fight scenario training. That's what uh, the population in general, I feel, doesn't understand when it comes to police shootings. You know, there have been a number of police shootings, a real high profile one in Philly, but uh, recently, but uh, where people are coming after cops with knives already drawn and and they get shot. Surprise, surprise. And they die. And then you hear people say, oh, you should have shot him in the leg or you should have should have maced him or you should have tased him. Well, you know, we've learned that that does not work when someone is amped up and coming after you, you know, uh, mace mace. They'll feel it later if they feel it at all, you know. Um, so yeah, someone with a knife can be very quick and, you know, if your gun is already drawn and you're ready to go or, or if you're a highly trained individual, um, you know, 
Maybe, but but in that sort of close situation, it it is it's terrifying how how a knife can come into play and how little skill it takes to 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 bring it to to deadly effect. Absolutely, and and speaking of uh, all the cop engagements or security guards, whatever it is, I've seen tons of um, uh, video footage of real machete attacks all over the world, the knife attack, and the response is logical to go towards your lethal weapon in order to stop a lethal attack. And this is why training is so important. It's like the, uh, the flight response and also the flinch response. Someone goes to, if someone just went to touch your face walking down the street, you'd be ah, your hands would come up, right? It's this, it's similar. If someone is attacking you, you're thinking I have a lethal weapon. This is what I need to survive the encounter. But if you haven't trained, you don't know about the distancing and the empty hand tactics needed to deploy that weapon so you can use it efficiently. And that's that's very, very important. That's where a lot of people, uh, um, and fortunately I've been educated on this. I haven't been attacked by a weapon. Thank God. I understand the principle so I can train it, God forbid that it does happen. But there are people who are going out thinking they can do something in live time. And then it happens, and a lot of times they don't make it out alive, you know. And if they're lucky enough to, and they're still going to do that police job, or they're still going to be a security or military person, whatever their job is where they're in danger, they really need to get educated on it. Well, it, it might be safe to say, like, just like a gun person might say to the knife person or the martial arts person, I, ha I have a gun, so I have it taken care of. Uh, you could reverse it and say, well, if, if you train in, you know, with, with firearms and that's your main mode of protection, still, it's probably still a good idea to get uh, hand to hand training, some ha empty hand training, because, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of rungs on the ladder before draw your gun and shoot someone dead. And if you draw your gun, you're going to, you know, you should probably be wanting to shoot them dead. I, I can't imagine you would have a gun on you for any other reason than to do that. So, uh, uh, you know, I would say, I would say it's probably good to know both. So you don't have to rely on necessarily drawing your gun. It's, it's essential to know both because you carry knives all the time. I'm sure most of your listeners carry knives all the time. I carry knives all the time. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is more likely to happen in your life? A fight where you don't have to take the guy's life or a fight where you have to take his life? I, I, uh, I know, uh, I won't mention their name, but I know someone personally who talks about, I have a gun, uh, good luck, you know, do this, I'm going to do this. You're not taking your gun out if someone's just pushing you or punching at you in a fight. You'll go to jail. You might be efficient using it, but then you're going to jail. So it's essential if you're talking about self-protection that you have a unified skill set that you have other things to rely on, not only to create space and use your weapon, but just for everyday encounters, even carrying a tactical pen, you put that tactical pen on a part of the body, it can, that can kill you. People don't even think about that. I, uh, I don't know if I have it here. I have a 511 tactical pen and it's sharp as hell. Oh, yeah. And you stab somebody in the neck with that because you think it's an impact tool, which it is, and it's not a knife but you don't understand the real damage it can do. So it's very, very important to have that empty hand training because it's most likely what you're going to use. So for me, it's almost a joke concept to carry a lethal weapon with no, with number one, no training and no empty hand tactics to back it up. For me, 99% of the time, it's almost like you're carrying nothing because what, what are you really going to do with that? If you, or, or if you only yeah. Oh, go ahead. Or you're carrying around the the uh, the object of your undoing, uh, either legally or you shoot yourself or you shoot someone you don't intend to and it ruins your life. You know, whatever it is. Or you you deploy your knife in a self defense situation and the guy's three hundred pounds and he catches your wrist and you think you're gonna do this fancy move that you learned. You know from a movie or something and then he takes you to the ground and his weight is on that weapon and you cannot get your weapon. And now he can take it from you and use it on you. It happens in, I've seen it in simulation training with police. I've seen it. Uh, I've done it to my students. I have taken knives off of my students and killed them with it in training to show them the point that your weapon is my weapon. Right? So the, 
protecting that weapon is just as important as being able to use it. So you don't want it to come back onto yourself, which is also why training is so important. So that's a great point. Uh, I, I had something funny happen once I was at my daughter's, uh, uh, you know, spring concert at school when she was in like first grade or something. And I sit down in the chair and across the, across the uh, aisle from me is an, an older dude. And, uh, you know, you can just tell with people. I mean, he looked, he looked perfectly nice. He was well-dressed, but you could just tell this old guy was a badass. You know, you can just tell with people they have a vibe. And, uh, I noted him and that's about it. And then during the intermission, he comes over to me and creepily whispers in my ear, I see both of your knives and you should probably have them in your pocket because where I used to work, people would take them and kill you with them. And then he, he moved on. There's a little Catholic school, you know? I was like, wow, okay, noted. And for a while I did that. And then I got back in the habit of just, you know, just throwing it in my pocket and not thinking about it. But his point was very well taken, uh, especially, especially with the kind of person who is likely to do something like that, they're gonna know what a knife clip is. They're gonna know the difference between a knife clip and any other clip, a pen or blah, 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 whatever it is that people like to pretend their their pocket clips might look like. And uh, they could take it from you and use it. So you do have to be careful. All righty, sir. Uh, Ian, I would like to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie sure. podcast. As always, it's a pleasure talking to you. And I just love, uh, I love absolutely. getting your, your take. Absolutely. On, uh, and another thing that, uh, and I, until I started. Please. Yeah. Thank Sorry you so about much that. For having me. That was, that was really great. <laughs> oh, All right. We had one of those, we had one of those awesome halting, uh halting ends uh we had a little bit of a uh, little interference going on here but uh i want to say thank you man and it's been a pleasure <laughs> we'll speak to you soon take care visit the knife junkie at the knife junkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes videos photos and more Ah, this modern age. I love it. Uh, it was great talking to Ian, a good friend of mine. And uh, he's one of those people who I remember when I was age 44 and he was only 22. And he had he uh, we were training together. And I remember thinking, wow, I can keep up with this guy. And that lasted for um, not very long, not only physically, but man, his skills and his knowledge and his, you know, his religiosity about martial arts to far surpassed mine. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to know him, especially to have exposure to all these different modern combative styles with knives, because that is a, that is an aspect of this whole hobby that fascinates me. Um, if not most second most, uh, uh, and it, you know, it is theoretical until heaven forbid it, it isn't. And then it's a good thing to kind of at least have in your mind or have considered, uh, the martial application of knives. Uh, I want to thank Ian Lewis. Like I just mentioned, he has a gym that he's opening up in Alexandria, Virginia, one of the few, uh, Mastro defense systems, uh, schools in the country. Uh, definitely check out Fred Mastro online. He's got some really cool videos. Also check out Paul Vunak online. He's got a lot of these tremendous videos uh, showing uh, street fighting tactics that go way back into the 80s. You can see some some great deadly mullet footage. And uh, he's got a great series where he's in a bar and plays out all these different scenarios with all these actors and uh, and stuntmen who have um, who have motorcycle helmets on. And he shows uh, how he would escape a mass attack in a pool hall and all these kind of things. Uh, V-U-N-A-K. Uh, so anyway, it's all interesting stuff to me. And uh, uh, well, I thought I'd, I'd bring you an episode of, of Marshall Blade Talk. So this is Bob DeMarco uh, for the Knife Junkie Podcast saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.